All right, welcome everybody. We'll start the 11 o'clock session now. I'm O'Brien McKinley with Globecom. Um, I work in the media entertainment uh, business unit for Globecom. Um, got a vast back of uh, broadcast experience from PBS, CNN, and various entities in between. And want to welcome everybody to this session. Uh, over the top, what is it? Uh, hopefully we can define that within an hour. Um, I know it's taken lawyers and uh, media engineers several days to cry, try and create a definition, so hopefully we can do it in an hour. So the, uh, the forum topic, as a, as a refresh, so broadcast and OTT origination currently uh, requires multiple devices carefully linked and made inop uh, inoperable to one another as well as considerable manual labor to produce content optimized for a growing range of distribution platforms. Manufacturers, media companies, and business video producers are, pers are pursuing a replacement for these ad hoc systems, complete integrated platforms that can ingest content in any format, move through the automated workflow, and play out in any format. So again, anytime, anywhere. And that's what we're going to uh, discuss, talk about here, learn the behind the scenes, uh, get some you know, Q&A from our, from our uh, experts here, um, and walk through it. And speaking of our experts, let's run down the, uh, the list. To my left is Mr. Roger Franklin. He's CEO of Crystal Solutions out of Atlanta. Next to him from PrimeStream is uh, Senior Director of uh, Technology for PrimeStream, Mr. Ton Franz, and Ed Behan at the end, uh, who is our VP at Globecom over the uh, entertainment, or entertainment, the uh, enterprise, excuse me, uh, business unit. So welcome, gentlemen. Thank you very much. And session, what we're going to do, each presenter is going to take a, a few minutes uh, to give a little background on their company, the interrelation respects to OTT, um, and then we're going to open it up from Q&A uh, from myself, the moderator, and uh, anybody from the audience. Uh, the main thing I want you all to go away with is to have an educated understanding examination of OTT. So let's have that, all right? A little bit about me and Crystal. I'm Roger Franklin. The uh, company is Crystal Solutions. Uh, Crystal's been around since 1986. Um, I was actually 15 years old when I started working there and uh, kind of grown up in this industry. So uh, I happen to love the industry. That's about all I know from a professional standpoint. Uh, Crystal specializes in intelligent control systems. When we look at the workflows that are required to ingest once, play out anywhere, Crystal, Crystal's customers use our product to help automate some of those workflows and keep an eye on the distribution, contribution and distribution chains to make sure that the equipment is performing and the content is, is going where it needs to go. And also that the content contains what it needs to contain as it's being ingested and distributed. When, uh, when we gaze, looking at OTT and gaze into the crystal ball a little bit to see what things might be coming down, um, I'm gonna just throw out a few things of, of what I see and some things that we need to think about. Um, I don't have all the answers, but you'll get a little bit of insight, hopefully, today from what we discuss here. So, the first thing I see is a hodgepodge of, of new technologies trying to fit into old business models. And sometimes they look like this. It doesn't always work, doesn't always fit. Um, instead of the video industry focusing on better and newer ways to deliver video, they, they sat back and collected uh, billions of dollars doing the same thing year after year. And lo and behold, the consumers changed, the devices that they used to watch television changed, and now the video industry is playing catch up. And until we get it right, um, our consoles are gonna look a little messy, I'm afraid. The other thing that, that I've come aware of, um, Everybody in this room knows what good TV looks like. Uh, the people at home, most of them really don't care. It's sad, but the, the quality of, of what people watch, not only the content, but the video quality, uh, makes me cringe. But it, they still watch it. Um, 
sometimes we strive for perfection and I'm not sure from a business perspective that's absolutely required. Um, so it's, it's, it breaks my heart, but that's the world we live in. And, and one of the other things we need to really think about is things have to be dirt simple. Um, my uncle was over at my parents' house. Uh, my dad obviously did a fair amount in this industry, very technically savvy. Um, my uncle was over there, and, and they were panicked because it was 10 minutes after the start of their show, and they thought they were going to miss primary parts of their show. My parents were like, relax. We'll just start, you know, rewind the DVR and watch it from the beginning. And they're like, you can do that? They had no idea. It has to be extremely simple for consumers to use, and that includes building user interfaces that are, are accurate, simple, easy to use, and above all, they work time after time. Things to think about is, as, as we were talking earlier, when the move from SD to HD occurred, um, there's a lot of expense involved, not a whole lot of additional revenue. Uh, when we look at distributing to new platforms, there's a lot of money being spent on getting video out to new platforms. Uh, the business models aren't quite there yet. Somebody ultimately pays for this. And as we look at the new technologies, I think the industry needs to start with what are the business models that make sense? Regardless of what technologies exist, what are the business models that make sense? And how do we, how do we turn those business models into reality with technology? And sometimes you have to start small, uh, prototype things, and sometimes you even have to fail and figure out what doesn't work before you can find out what does work. Um, and as, as the video industry continues to cash in billions of dollars in ad revenue, although it's diminishing, they need to, they need to start the R&D shops up and figure out what is going to work in order to keep that money coming in. Um, my name is Todd Fonts. I work with PrimeStream Incorporated, which some of you uh, may formerly have known as uh, Building for Media. We're a software broadcast automation uh, company. Um, we've been around in some form or the other since about 1990, and um, PrimeStream is based out of <coughs> Miami. Uh, Building for Media was uh, based out of the <coughs> Netherlands. Uh, the first entry we had into uh, the business was uh, primarily standard uh, definition playout automation software, and we've expanded mainly into the production model. So where we touch this topic is we're dealing with customers uh, such as CBS, the NFL, NASCAR, CNN, who are making the content um, to drive these systems. Uh, and these markets. Um, I would say that our leaning over the last five years has been that uh, metadata and metadata acquisition, metadata driven workflows is what makes um, smarter products on the other end possible. So we've spent a lot of time on the production side in making tools for uh, automated uh, metadata acquisition, logging, uh, workflow processes that are all driven off of um, not necessarily the content of the video frame, but the metadata about an asset, uh, life cycles, um, ratings, appropriateness, uh, value. Um, uh, I would repeat some of the things just said, uh, my experience with customers is that um, the business model seems to come second. Um, they're producing content based off of their primary existing broadcast product. And uh, the question starts with nothing more than, can't we do something else with this? And it's kind of an afterthought about what the product actually winds up being but they quickly realize that they can't take their secondary channel or their website or their web app and throw the same proportionate number of resources, especially people, at that product when the business model and certainly the revenue doesn't justify it yet. Um, I'll give a couple examples. Uh, last week I was in Brazil with a customer and they were a traditional newspaper and a traditional broadcaster 
and they were facing the same problem everybody has, which is that their web staff came from the newspaper side and the video was being processed by the television side and somewhere in the middle were a couple people who knew something about the website and the app that they were putting out and it was entirely dysfunctional and they weren't, <coughs> weren't making any money off of it but as a marketing thing they understood that they had to be in that space but they had no concept of where this was going to go next in terms of um, the company um, the newspaper was uh, in trouble, as most newspapers are around the world, except maybe India. And um, if you talk to both their editorial and engineering staff, it was a matter of chasing the next codec or the next development platform or whatever. It was not a clear vision. And I'd say that's true for most of our customers who are in this space. And to be fair, most of our customers are traditional broadcasters. Our products uh, are designed to produce full baseband, ingest, playout, et cetera, in addition to the OTT uh, applications. Um, but we've got a couple things coming up I'd like to mention. Um, on our radar, H265 HEVC is out. And it's going to be, for us, initially uh, a distribution codec. But as with most codecs, people start off claiming something as a distribution codec. And then all of a sudden, the camera starts recording that codec. And you've got an acquisition codec. Uh, so we're looking at that very seriously. And I would expect somebody uh, disruptive like Go or somebody to be producing H.265 cameras inside of the next 12 months. Um, 4K for us is coming up. People don't know what to do with it, but I would expect uh, you know the the um, good rumors about Apple TVs coming out with a 4K uh, panel and an interface that a lot of people are are very familiar with. I would expect. Uh, people to be asking how do we deliver 4K HEVC to my Apple TV uh, within the next six months. Um, XAVC on the codec side, Sony has released their version of what they think 4K production is going to be about. Um, that throws into question the relevance of RED cameras, which is what many of our customers are currently using for 4K. I think Sony's going to be very strong in their push to uh, replace that. But again, uh, back to some of the things just mentioned, um, I was watching a telenovela in Brazil last week that was shot on HD cam, which I believe starts at about 400 megabits. And it was completely beautiful. But when I went to my hotel, I was watching it on um, SD over the air analog then stretched out to a 16 by 9 television set which made it completely pointless but um, the idea that um, a customer would invest that kind of money and very high-end editing equipment to produce a soap opera is kind of interesting and um, obviously if they get to the point of a model where you could distribute a 4K soap opera cost effectively to a user's home, uh, they'll be in a position to have technically very beautiful pictures, but to a soap opera viewer, I'm not convinced that's particularly relevant. Um, but that's where some of this money seems to be going at the moment. Um, so for us, uh, as a company, we're mainly concerned with workflow at the moment um, because we know that our customers not only can't afford to ingest once and then ingest twice, they also can't afford to tag once and then dump that file over to their other product and tag it again. Um, the things have to go from ingest to play out to transcoding to archiving and be uh, unified. 
Um, some of the efforts in that space uh, are FIMS, if you've never heard of FIMS, uh, is an attempt to turn many of these services into uh, well, services and allow people to do a little bit of more plug and play with such problematic areas such as archiving and MAM and acquisition and uh, you know, kind of controlled automation of file movement and uh, also to some extent um, you know we see BXF on the broadcast side starting to leach into uh, sorry I guess that's a pun um, <laughs> starting to move into some areas where it wasn't originally intended to apply but um, might uh, be beneficial to some of the larger uh, workflow ideas. Um, and uh, the other uh, point for us is being able to do, um, we're a MAM company at the moment and we're getting increasing uh, requests to do things like Word documents and other non-broadcast traditional things that are getting tied up. Uh, we were asked at NAB if we could take scans of napkins because one of their producers' favorite thing to do was to come in with a pile of napkins outlining a production shoot. And um, on that front, we see that traditional MAM companies are being asked to be dams and dams are being asked to be MAMs, and a lot of that's being done via acquisition. Uh, so uh, document companies are buying video modules and video companies and trying to strap them together. Um, we uh, are not going to get into that business exactly, but we are gonna be focused on production-based document management as well as just video asset management. Um, but I see a convergence very logically between documents, web publishing, app publishing, advertising, spot placement, all of these things at a high level are really exactly the same problem. If I'm producing a piece for air, it's got to go into uh, PR, it needs placement on a website, it needs placement in an application, it needs user rights and management so that somebody can't pick it up and do something not only on the production side but on the advertising side, on the PR side. Um, it all becomes uh, the same at a certain altitude and um, we need to move into that uh, more and we are, um, but we get plenty of uh, uh, interesting RFPs where at the end of the engineering discussion we discover that they actually have no video ingest and they actually have no video playout. It's all file based and um, from, uh, from my world that's not necessarily video um, but uh, we get plenty of people who are using nonlinear editors who have not a single BNC connector in their entire operation. It comes in, it goes out, um, files are FTP'd in. I should mention that we have a, a product that's targeted for multi-site production and aggregation. That's gaining a decent amount of traction. People are no longer <coughs> satisfied with the idea that the video is on another site and that's inaccessible to them. In the markets we work in, uh, bandwidth is always, always the number one issue. Um, we just did a project for um, someone I won't mention in the United States, but you would think that that company would have all the bandwidth in the world, <coughs> and they don't. So in terms of moving baseband full res files around the country, even in the United States, it's not a viable option at the moment for anything but the most uh, valuable of your content. So, um, so the world I live in is, is one of how corporations uh, manage and, and communicate with video. And um, I'm just, I just have two slides uh, on just two of, two of the networks that we operate. Uh, the, the first one here is Rollins, which is um, Orkin Pest Control is probably how you best know them. And um, in their world, they have uh, 
a, a, pretty, a pretty tough challenge where they have um, annually about 40% of their employee base turns over. And they have to certify these people in all 50 states um, and around the world on how to um, spray for bugs, that sort of stuff. And so um, for, for them, they, they have uh, two different types of networks they have to go out over. The first is a corporate terrestrial network, which is basically a private WAN. That's an MPLS network. And then the second um, for, and for their franchisees, and there's about 100 different offices around the world, um, they have to go out over Internet CDN. Um, part of the challenge also for them is that uh, some people are on computers, some people are on mobile devices, and, um, and when they do learning, the, the learning environment they like to be in is where people are watching on, an, on a TV, but it needs to be live and interactive. So the challenge for us, it really becomes how do you ingest once and deliver everywhere. So um, what you'll see on this diagram here is um, they have their corporate studios in Atlanta, and, th and we're able to bring them into a, to a head end where for their live programming, they, they're able to dual feed that over that MPLS network and the internet CDN, um, and which, which is a little bit of a challenge because we're multicast here and unicast here, and um, we need to hit all of those devices once. And, you know, and, and distribute over both of those. But then we add another layer of complexity in there where because it's live and interactive and they use interactive voice, how are we able to keep the latency across both networks under three and a half seconds? So um, that, that poses a, a, a series of challenges, but then what we do after that is they have um, about a thousand hours of on-demand training for their folks. And they need to deliver that to the to the lo to the stores, and because that's unicast, we have to cache it at the local location, but also host it on Internet CDN, and be able to deliver it to any device there. So um, we see networks like this as being a real particular challenge, and what we have to do is come in and develop head-end technology that allows us to work over hybrid networks and and hit all of the devices while keeping latency low. And there's a lot of tricks in what we have to do there. Um, largely, um, one of the bigger challenges is how do you get latency low in the, in, over the internet? And um, part of what we've had to do here at Globecom was develop a way to um, eliminate the origin server from the CDN and build that into our head end so that we're able, um, an origin server basically, when you hit that with a stream, um, replicates that stream for any format. Um, we need, we need to bring that into the head end because they create um, about 25 seconds of latency there in, in on the CDN. If you're watching like um, NFL Network or NBA, you'll, you'll see that that feed is delayed pretty significantly. And uh, that, that's how we are able to come through and get through that. In addition, when we get to those, um, some of the things that we've had to do that are particularly interesting are, um, you'll see here, where we're going to a TV environment um, for interactive learning, um, we need to allow these people to use their own device to, as the interactive device. So we've had to write apps that, that integrate into the platform that will allow someone from an iOS or an Android device to be able to answer polling questions that come up on a screen, be able to um, push a button to raise their hand and, and actually get a duplex conversation with the instructor here and get that in real time so that everybody across all these networks are able to um, participate in it. And what we're seeing this, uh, typically in the enterprise world, enterprises follow broadcasters, but here they're kind of leading a little bit, and um, particularly in the levels of interactivity. Another network that we're doing right now with a lot of the same challenges is JCPenney. So for JCPenney, there's 1,200 stores and if you go in there, um, we're having to move content all around in, in their store location. And when they had um, Ron Johnson from the Apple stores came in as their CEO, the um, first thing he did was get rid of the cash register, and everybody gets an iTouch when they come into work. And that iTouch, like this one here, becomes where they do their training. It's where they're watching corporate broadcasts. Um, and, and we've got to deliver anywhere in the store 
content there. We also have to deliver customer-facing um, signage, employee-facing digital signage, um, run digital displays, and do that same sort of classroom environment, and then also be able to hit back, in, back office folk on their, um, on their desktops. Um, to do that again, it's the same sort of thing for live. We have to bring that in, figure out how to replicate all of it. In their case, it's distributed over satellite, um, run through an appliance that they have, um, they have it's um, 950, 45 minute videos that they have to have on, um, reside on this box. So we need to put a lot of storage in here. The next challenge with that storage is because that we have to take that file. Um, with that number of files, you can't just send files for each different format. You're gonna have to reformat that in the appliance. So we've had to build into our appliance the um, streaming server technology that allows you to put wrappers to play out to any device. And that creates another real challenge. So that's um, a little bit of the world that we work in with our um, Tempo platform here at Globecom. Thanks, Ed, appreciate it. Now, uh, before we uh, continue on, as I've got uh, you know, some, uh, some $64 million questions that's gonna get answered. Um, and uh, Lou, if uh, you could help us you know, with uh, some new physics on uh, how to get that latency down in the satellite space, that would be great. I saw him back there. But uh, yeah, um, and if there's any questions uh, in the audience now, you know, we'll be happy to take them for the panel. Uh, question on, on the MAM, sir, on the MAM technology. Uh, just this person becoming more familiar with it. Mm -hmm. At what size do you see, I mean, a lot of advanced capabilities with MAMs and now integration into play out or bond distribution platforms or OTT platforms. Are you, are you, are you focused mainly on content creators or content distributors? And, at, and at, at what point do you see either of those deciding to move into more advanced MAM systems? Is that across the board or only with the largest? Or where do you see the penetration moving from kind of the way that they were storing it to where, how they should be storing it? The first thing to say is, is my observation is, is that that's, again, the afterthought, is the business models come first about how they're going to make revenue off of the content. And so we're dealing with a lot of operations who uh, literally their MAM is the Excel spreadsheet, is the FileMaker database, and they have a closet full of hard drives which has a label with the month of the stuff that they made and they put it in the closet. And so um, I, I think the MAM part of it enters into the equation when someone comes up with the secondary business that they think they can drive off of their content for a broadcaster. Uh, I mean, broad, broadcasters are, um, and for very good reason, conservative. And if an operation is working and making money, they're not going to mess with that. It's going to be the guy who says, you know, I can make 100000 a year if you can give me five video clips a week. And then they start pulling it apart to figure out where are those clips coming from, what format do they have to be in, how can I transcode it, how can I manage it, that kind of stuff. So um, I see large broadcasters moving into MAM when they can find new businesses. There just really isn't any reason to disrupt. Um, again, I'll use my example from last week. This is a very large, very popular, multi-state, essentially national uh, Brazilian company who is just getting involved in that because they need the synergy with their other businesses that they're trying to launch. If they didn't have those new businesses, their broadcast operation probably would have remained untouched for another five years or so. So. Um, but to, to get to your question, um, you know, the, the play out side of things, the price for a channel of play out in the broadcast space continues to come down. Um, what many people talk about is play out right now is over the top. It's not base band into anything. And um, again, that really depends on the business model. Um, I mean, I 
again, without naming names, we can, we can probably come up with plenty of examples of people who will tell you that they have a channel that no one's watching and no one's ever heard of. So the business model comes first, and really the thought about managing that always comes in relationship to a revenue stream. So those are always the equations that we're dealing with. Even on the engineering side, they're starting with the product that's going to make them money, and they come back to the minimal amount of metadata and workflow and tagging that they need to have to generate that. So um, uh, I see that, uh, at least as far as broadcasting goes, I'm not sure there's a terrible amount of progress to be made on the traditional play outside, but there's a tremendous amount of synergy that's going to have to happen between the MAM, the DAM, the CMS, because that's where the new products are being made out of. Um, I, I just, um, the number of people launching over the air channels is in this market not a compelling uh, business to be in right now. And it has a lot of, uh, on our side, it has a lot of competition. Uh, uh, what's the phrase we use? Uh, uh, the race to be the lowest, cheapest, and put yourself out of business as a product uh, model. And um, at least in the MAM side of things, the number of people competing in that space is more limited on kind of the enterprise level, and uh, it needs, uh, it's part of my job, it needs people continuously looking at what new products are trying to be put to market and making sure we can address those. Um, but that's it in a nutshell. You know, and, and Todd, you're talking about in that in the comment there, um, you need a business plan. It's an interesting note because I was uh, talking with a, with a broadcast colleague uh, the other day. Um, everybody knows Mr. Rich Wolf, um, and we go back and forth and have these discussions, debates, whatever you want to call them, you know, about technology and, and where we see things moving. He brought up an interesting point. Even I had to write it down here because uh, I wanted to share it with everybody today. And uh, his comment, you know, on this subject is, uh, very specific, and, and he says that today's analog dollars need to be wisely and carefully spent um, so as to meet the ever-changing demand of the viewing public. Uh, there will be still a need for television as we know it, uh, but the way in which we will view it will be never the same. We need to adapt to these changes as long as it marries with a revenue plan uh, that support the effort. And in addition, you know, he, uh, he had said, we're on the verge of buying technology because it's just technology, um, not because it makes sense and can do the best job for the customer. You know, so I, I think those are critical comments that we need to you know, always keep in the back of our mind as we're analyzing any technology, albeit you know, AVR or uh, all ma uh, automatic for formatting distribution, things of that nature. Let me, let me take a question back uh, to you guys. Um, and Roger, you know, we're, we're talking about, you know, over the top and as it relates to, you know, ABR and any time and anywhere. I, and, and this is that $64 million question, you know, with this over the top, you know, where do you think we're going to see ourselves, you know, with this ever changing technology, you know, and will we have an ad hoc or some type of system, you know, and, and just your, your kind of view in the crystal ball, if you will, no pun intended you know, in, in 8, 10, 24 months? The, um, you know, you, you mentioned ABR. It's, it's great technology. It helps to limit the amount of bandwidth required. Right. Um, at the end of the day, we've got to distribute video from point A to point B. And it's no longer point A to point B, C, D, and E. It's, it's shoot, truly unicast. Um, and that's where, that's where the networks have to change. We need caching. We need caching at closer to the consumer, whether that's in their own home or, or at the bottom of the cell tower or somewhere. We have the wireless industry fighting for bandwidth so they can broadcast video. <coughs> Ironically, they want to steal it from satellite users that are broadcasting video with it. 
there's got to be a better way, better formula for getting video closer to the consumer so that they can pick it up when and where they want it. And, and the other component, as, as Todd mentioned, is the metadata embedded with that video. That's, that's how this video is going to get monetized in additional ways, which is going to pay for the technology required to get the video to the consumers. So, Will, with that metadata, do you see any enhanced efforts? You know, like, you know, and, and now, you know, one of the pushes is like the MXF wrapper. Uh, the, um, I'm not exactly familiar with the MXF, so the, I mean, some of the, some of the metadata that is available today, and, and Keith was talking about that earlier, is audio embedded metadata, um, mm -hmm. which can be heard by devices that are not transmitting or receiving the content. And that allows, when you're, when you're trans, I mean, it's the world's oldest wireless technology, um, sound. And when you transmit metadata from your TV to your smartphone or your tablet, your tablet can know what you're watching and can present you with additional information that you did not have before. Um, in some circles, it's, it's valuable for the information itself. In others, it's, um, it's something that advertisers really need to take a look at. Um, because they can learn a lot more and they can present to the user more information than they did before. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's, it's that type of metadata when you look at a unicast situation. How effective is it? Where is it? Who's receiving it? How are they using it? What are they doing with it? That, that this industry really needs to take a good look at. And it all starts with the business model. It's not enough to just push the data out there and see who caught it. What are they going to do with it and how, do, and how do you act on what they do with it? So, in continuing that, you see, you know, that, that data, you know, the, the collection of data in a duplex system now, you know, for real, real world. Uh, do you see a trend, you know, where, in, you know, in advertising, you know, data is king, you know, as, as the ads runs and, you know, like with uh, NBC, CBS, ABC and, and the Nets, you know, if I've got a primetime show and it's a number one, you know, that means I can, you know, charge more ad revenue, you know, in that slot. Right. Well, and, and, and who says it's number one? Right now, Nielsen does. Yep. It may not be number one to the buyers that are selling something through that particular show. And so to one advertiser, it might be number one in, in, in number of eyeballs. To another advertiser, another show might be number one in the results they get off the advertisement <coughs> distributed on that show. Oh. Yeah. Good points. Good points. So it's it's there's a lot to be considered there, <laughs> and and with that to be considered, you know, uh, with this content distribution, uh, pretty much anytime, anywhere. Let me let me ask Ed. You know, you have very similar sets of needs and requirements. Where do you see this 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 going um, in you know in the near term future? So, I mean, for us, the two things that are the real challenges coming up are, are is the interactivity. Um, in, in the world where we're working, it, it's all about um, the different levels of, of interactivity. Um, I mean, if you think about somebody who's watching uh, American Idol, when they're, um, when, they're when, when, they, when they vote, they're voting from their mobile device, which is a second device. Um, as, as that moves to start becoming the... Um, they're, if they're, you know, they're viewing on the mobile device or viewing on their desktop, how do they vote? Um, and then how does that interaction start to increase and what are those levels of interaction? Um, the other thing we see coming out of our world is search and, and the need with all of this, and whether you're searching metadata or actually searching the um, audio transcripts, how do, you, how do you really get down and be able to search? Because um, the viewer has changed. The viewer is no longer passive and really wants to have that level of control. And, and th those are the two places where we really see this, um, a lot of change coming in the next uh, couple of years. Nice, thanks, thanks. And, and Todd, you know, with, with all these changes, you know, and we talk about how, how great the technology is, what do you see the obstacles, you know, in, in facing these changes? Um, well, uh, something that we, uh, I brought up uh, initially is um, this hasn't changed really from um, analog tape land. Archiving uh, and managing an archive and monetizing an archive back to the business idea, that remains one of our customers' largest uh, problems 
um, if you ask a librarian what you're supposed to keep out of a production, um, they'll tell you, well, everything. And that's very expensive. And without metadata and tagging from the source through the process, it, it essentially gets lost. Uh, I mean, my observation is, is that most of our customers spend a disproportionate amount of money on archiving technology, manpower, all of the above, and uh, they simply never get any return out of it. Um, even a news operation, the, the amount of uh, retention uh, that really needs to happen is a fraction of, of what's being spent on, on it. Um, even with the costs of tape, uh, solutions going down. We've now started seeing archive companies based on replacing tape entirely with solid state um, storage. The cost of that goes down fantastically every year. Um, it's still disproportionate to the smarts of the production. They're so concerned about saving uh, things. And in the case of um, one of our customers is, is Disney Latin America. You can obviously say that the amount of money that they put into each frame of each production makes it very valuable content. On the other hand, you know, they're saving the second and third shoot camera tapes for posterity. Um, I, I just really kind of, again, kind of question that. So um, in terms of a, a problem to get over, <clears throat> some of it is perception. It's um, the perception that all of your content is equally valuable and needs to be stored, and especially stored in bulk. Um, I always phrase that uh, from the perspective of, well, how are you going to turn around and use that a second or third time to make some money? Again, Disney can uh, churn out DVDs for the anniversary and the behind the scenes and, and things, and so that's not particularly relevant. but. Um, especially many of our news and sports operations, you really just have to question um, how much they're archiving. Uh, um, and back to another point made about quality, we're talking about, you know, codecs that will hopefully deliver equal quality and the same bandwidth, but most viewers seem to be quite content with YouTube quality. Um, you know, saving your archive at JPEG 2000 just questions whether you're ever going to have a product that's up to the level of bandwidth that you're that you're throwing at the archive. Um, so that's one of our uh, issues. The second one, I think, um, at least in our production space, is um, the industry um, in going to primarily software-based products. We have a decent amount of fragmentation and lack of interoperability on the craft edit side. So that's something that in the next 24 to 36 months I think may change yet again. Um, to be specific, um, Avid uh, has not really been able to capitalize on Final Cut Pro essentially leaving the market and Adobe Premiere has arguably also not been able to take and fill that space the way one might have expected uh, 12 to 24 months ago. So uh, particularly we're looking at uh, a craft edit side of things which at the end of the day it's always somewhere in that process that somebody has and we're looking at essentially self-contained off-the-shelf pieces of software that don't particularly integrate well with a MAM or a DAM or a workflow that you want, yet it's invaluable to every operation and your craft editor is where your money gets made out of a secondary use of video. Um, that for us is a continuing uh, problem. Uh, Adobe in our space is uh, spending a lot of time and resources trying to understand the broadcast market. They have uh, a decent amount of experience, obviously, in the interactive web online market. Um, I hope that they continue to uh, put that kind of investment towards it. But um, I'd say uh, our customers come to us, first of all, with what archive do I use? 
what storage platform do I use, and then what craft editor should I be buying? And those questions uh, really have been up in the air for uh, several years now, and I'm not sure it's particularly clear uh, going forward. Um, I have to say, and this is probably a plug, um, we've been fairly happy with the uh, Harmonic Media Grid storage as of late. Um, they seem to have solved a lot of the longer term cost of installation and support uh, for our customers. Um, but there are plenty of people entering that market and leaving it in six months increments. So it's, a, it's an interesting uh, place to be right now. We'll dive in a little bit. We'll get you with Brian Morris to get you connected to a Harmonic and they'll pay you off for that. We look at obstacles, you know, content is king. You know, and, and with content being king and you get, uh, you know, a, a company I work for still had two inch tape, you know, and how do you get it to that next level? And, and that's, you know, with uh, one of our next sessions after lunch, uh, in just once, play out many. But, uh, you know, we, we keyed on, you know, with this OTT model, you know, the storage that's behind it, you know, and, and each of you in your respective uh, areas of concentration, you know, we, we and us at Globecom as well, we see storage, you know, and how we effectively deal with it. And not only do we have it, you know, for legacy, but also for future and those abilities to plug it into the future. Where do you guys see the, um, with, with this model trending, you know, and this is all about, you know, looking, looking forwardly, you know, in, in OTT and the storage, you know, LTO is one thing, you know, but, uh, you know, LTO is almost, you know, phased out, if you will. So where do you see those trends going? And I'll just take it down the line, if you will. Sure, sure. Um, content is king, and, and for those in the media business, the more they can leverage that content to make money, the better off they are. And when you look at long-term storage on tape, um, it's great for offsite backups, but it's not searchable, it's not quickly retrievable. And there's some technology being developed that's going to make uh, tagging of video content for um, significant tagging of video content, content very feasible. And we're going to see that tagging technology come through on live shots. Um, so if you want to search for Ocho Cinco's uh, plays where he caught a ball with one hand, you'll be able to search the archives for that. Uh, we're going to start with, with live content, but at the end of the day, we're going to go back through all the other tapes and, and archived content and tag that as well so that it becomes searchable. Um, the, an interesting statistic I heard over the weekend from a friend of mine that works at Seagate is that currently there's about two zettabytes of data stored on the planet today. The estimate by 2020 is there will be about six. Uh, at the current production rates for storage, uh, hard disk storage and solid state storage is we're not going to have enough storage for those six zettabytes. Um, so something's going to happen and, and the selection is going to have to be made as to what's kept or ha what quality of, of information video is kept and how it's kept um, if, if we do come into a capacity crunch. Um, I'm sure that they'll increase capacity as, as quickly as they can, but not so much that they crash the prices because um, they still want to make money as well. Um, so from a, from a storage perspective on, on the content, I don't know where LTO fits in. If, if I were running a media business, um, I'd have to make some tough decision as to what gets archived on tape uh, for long-term storage that I don't think I'll need access to in the next foreseeable number of years um, for and unfortunately I don't know how to make that decision I don't I don't I don't have a crystal ball that sees into the future and can predict the future um, but it, it's 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 going to be a tough decision and uh, it'll be interesting to see how these media companies deal with the vast amounts of, of video they've got and we haven't even talked about 4k or 8k video storage at this point <laughs> Um, I think the storage thing has gotten a lot better over the, over the last year in that um, the CDNs have become so much better adept at handling mobile. 
-hmm. and um, and they're and they're able to wrap that content and deliver to any device in in such an easier way that it's um, it's actually relaxed a lot of the the storage restrictions that we've seen. Um, I, and I think with all of that content, the, the real challenge is, does become the metadata and becomes the ability to search. Um, one, of, one of the real challenges that we, we just recently had were um, in the network that we're running for JCPenney, uh, they'd, they'd let their CEO go. And, um, and we, we got notice, um, you have one hour, pull all the content with him on it or mention of him, period. Um, and uh, that, that, was, uh, that, that was quite a challenge. And it becomes a real metadata, um, how do you search those files? And, and not only know from the descriptions where he is, but know where he's spoken about. And it's, um, it, you know, we, we see a lot more of that and how do we solve those sort of problems going forward. Um, on, the, on the LTO side, um, I've been a little bit surprised. LTFS has been out <clears throat> for a little while now, and really our customers' main concern about LTO was always the cost equation about tape versus actual value, but also interoperability, which, which LTO has never really had. So people would get, you know, five, seven, three years into a particular LTO system and then the prospect of migrating to another archive L, but LTO based system was daunting so they'd stick it through with what they had despite not liking the company or the product or, or whatnot. Um, LTFS uh, um, holds the promise of solving the interoperability issues but it's coming at a time when uh, solid state storage or cloud based storage is uh, <clears throat> very competitive to that. So. We're seeing uh, a couple of our customers uh, who have an LTO history and no particular problem with tape uh, move to LTFS-based uh, systems. Um, the idea of being able to pull it off the shelf 10 years from now and plug it into a PC and be able to read it uh, is, is very appealing mm -hmm. to them. Um, again, I won't mention a, a customer's name, but somebody would be very surprised about uh, they have a MAM, they have an archive system, but uh, they've decided that their backup plan is they're posting all of their broadcast uh, finished pieces uh, to YouTube as the highest possible quality that they will allow and checking them all off as private. So no one can see them except the login of the company and they're letting YouTube pay for storing their high quality stuff long term. Their bet is, is that YouTube in some form will be around possibly longer than the uh, tape transport mechanism that they would be investing in uh, otherwise. Um, so um, I, I think it's to be said it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a point which any of these things might be the correct solution for a company um, but uh, on the legacy side, uh, LTFS is interesting for our customers who have uh, a history with tape and are, are comfortable with that. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it's becoming really hard to justify buying several refrigerator sized uh, uh, devices with robotic arms to uh, deal with your allegedly advanced file based workflow. So. And also the maintenance to support it as well. So we have uh, time for just another question from yes, sir. That I've been staring at that uh, diagram on the board. That's a great diagram. It's a good representation of an asymmetrical network. And we talked in a previous <laughs> panel about someone mentioned set-top boxes going by the wayside. So as we get more into the local Wi-Fi even mobile distribution of private content, how do you envision that we secure them? How do we keep security at a higher level? And the security in which respect? Protecting the data from anybody just grabbing it over Wi-Fi or, or mobile. So, I mean, for what we're doing, we're, we're doing it all, um, it, it's, a, it's, a pro, it's a closed network where we're requiring people to log in. Um, one of the things that, that becomes 
interesting and we have to do on the publishing side is, is how do we administer the rights to that content. I mean, in, in the case here, you have um, content that may be available to associates, but you don't want that content available to your customers. And it, it's, how, it's how do you tag that and build your, um, and, and build your security administration systems and, and how you're gonna, how you're gonna block that content that way, which becomes, becomes actually real difficult. So that wraps it up. Um, we are now ready to break for lunch, which is uh, the line starts just right out here in the uh, in the foyer, and then seating is in the center area. Thank you all for coming. Uh, we'll be